everyone. I'm Anne Marie from Brambleberry.com. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of Ask Anne Marie. You submitted your questions mostly on YouTube and Instagram and kind of all over. P.S. If you're not following us all over, you definitely should. We're at Brambleberry everywhere, including TikTok. Anyway, so these questions came in from all of our social media channels and I'm super excited to tackle them today. So first question, Tracy Fisher asks, what are the benefits of the small batch craft soaps to commercial? Why should our customers choose our soaps over say store-bought soap? Tracy, this is a great question and ironically one that I've literally spent my entire adult life thinking about working on answering and trying to proselytize. So simply put, your soap is better than most store-bought soap, most giant kind of detergent, synthetic detergent, manufactured soap because of the ingredients you put into it, because of the care you spend on it, the love you put into it, and the economics of it. So let's cover all of those. One, your ingredients, you choose them based on your preference for what you want. Do you want a bar that's moisturizing? Do you want a bar that's conditioning? Do you want a bar that has lots of lather? and or the types of customers that you have. Do you have customers that love natural? Do you have customers that love fun and fruity and really don't care about natural? Either way, the ingredients that you are choosing are natural, usually made with kind of pronounceable names and stuff that you could buy in a store or over the counter. So thanks for being a Brambleberry customer. Two, in terms of the product you make, let's talk about the economics. When you sell a bar, it is supporting you and your family. And statistics and studies show that when you support small business, that money stays in the community as opposed to going elsewhere to a giant corporation that's doing things like, well, tax avoidance strategies so that they don't pay taxes in the US. That's not something you do. You support your family, you support your community with every single bar you sell. That makes a more sustainable, economic system for you, your community, and everyone. And finally, the products you buy, make, and sell are generally made in a very sustainable way. Think about what you do at home to recycle, the water usage, all of that kind of stuff. You care about what you're putting into your body, you care about what you're putting on your body, and you care about the environment and you care about your community. So generally speaking, when someone buys a bar of soap from you, it's more sustainable, it's something that's gonna really benefit the community economically, and it's got better ingredients. So that's the trifecta of people should be buying handmade soap and they should be buying it from you. The next question really kind of dovetails into that last one from Tracy, and this one's from Eleven Rubina. I'm very curious about that name. What is the current state of the soap making world and where do I think it's heading? Well, awesome news is the soap making world is doing better than ever. There's a few reasons for this. One, making things with your hands and making things that are meaningful, that was a trend before 2020 and before the pandemic. In the pandemic, the search for meaning and the search for activity and the it's called the experience economy, doing things that are experiential, really became a thing as we started getting more isolated in our homes. So before the pandemic, people were making things with their hands because it felt good. They wanted to make meaning in their lives and they wanted to produce things of value to other people. That was already happening add in the pandemic and all of a sudden it's all about creating joy and experiences in your own home in a small and substantial way. So soap making really got popular in the pandemic. The second thing that I think is really gonna be happening in soap making is the move to natural, sustainable, organic, People really care about where their ingredients are coming. They care about who the farmers are that are producing them. And they want to know that what they are putting on their bodies is good for them, good for their families, good for the planet. So you get to choose what your ingredients are. So if you're concerned about palm oil and deforestation, for example, you know what? You don't have to make soap with palm oil. My last book, 50% of the recipes didn't use palm oil. So that's just one example of ways that sustainability can be done in the soap making community and the soap making world. And I do think that as the world becomes more aware of ingredients, that that's a trend we're gonna see. So soap making is growing. The desire to create community and community funded type things is growing. Look at all the uh, like GoFundMes and that type of thing for small business. People are recognizing that small business is where it's at. So soap making has sustainability, small business, better for you ingredients, experience economy, all wrapped into one. You get to make deeply meaningful products that benefit you and your community. So the state of soap making, it's good. It's on the rise. You're right in the right industry. 
So the next question is specifically around e-commerce. Shay Florian wants to know, is selling on sites like Etsy still worth it or should a business owner spring for their own site and promote on social media? Wow, this is such an interesting, good question. So there's this concept in e-commerce called digital sharecropping. And that means you build your business on someone else's platform. Meaning if they change the terms of service, they change how they're advertising, they change how much they want to charge you, your entire business is built on their platform and you are beholden to their whims. So for that reason, I think it's very important for you always to have your own website, always have some place that you can drive customers and always be able to own the relationship with the customer. If you're selling on Etsy, it's a great way to get your name out there. It's a great way to get started. But the reality is, is Etsy owns that customer, that relationship with, with Etsy, not with you. And you want to own the relationship with the customer because you are the best person to help shepherd them along to the next product that they're going to love. Cause let's face it, you make great products. The whole world needs to know about it. And when you own your own website with your own domain name and can push customers there, heart, uh, get their emails and keep that relationship going, you are better off for the long term. Now that doesn't mean you can't have an Etsy website or shouldn't do both. Absolutely do both. Etsy brings sellers to them, right? They're one of the di largest digital marketplaces in the world. Let's harness that for sure, but also have your own website always. So you always have a fallback or can transition from using Etsy customers over to your own website. So Ashley wants to know, uh, do I have any tips on getting into the farmer's market? My state has no regulation on soap requirements. Ashley, you wouldn't believe it. A lot of states don't have those kind of regulations, interestingly enough. So my state has no regulations on soap requirements, but the farmer's markets are always full and booked. What's a good way to start selling my soap so my local farmer's market will accept me? Ashley, great question. And I used to sell at farmer's markets back in the day when I was just starting out and using those that money to fund Brambleberry because I always wanted to teach people how to make soap. That was always my dream. So the way you get into a farmer's market, it's pretty simple. You create a niche for yourself that is not being served at the current farmer's market. So if the farmer's market is full, they probably have a rule that's like one or two soap makers per farmer's market. Okay, what can you sell that is something that you like to make, but isn't exactly in that soap making exact thing, right? Could you do balms and lip balms and bath fizzies and maybe have a couple cleansing bars and then at least establish yourself in the market. So when those soap makers do leave or move on, you can just slot right in and then increase your soap making. Do they only have cold process and melt and pour? Maybe they'd like a hot process soap maker that only did essential oils, for example. So look for the niche that isn't being served in that farmer's market make sure that when you do get into the farmer's market you go make friends with the other soap makers right away and you say hey I love what you do I am so inspired let's figure out how we can work together I am NOT gonna make what you're making I'm not making melt and pour soap I'm gonna focus only on this particular niche again bath fizzies maybe you're doing salt scrubs who knows what you're doing but tell them I'm just gonna focus on this niche I am here because a rising tide floats all ships and when people come to me for this and I don't have it I'm gonna send them to you would love it if you could do the same and PS here's some of my stuff to try I can't wait to see you at the market next week so make friends because you are all in it together when you're at the farmers market especially if you've created your own niche and if you want to learn more about selling successfully at farmers markets or just selling in general, go to brambleberry.com, click on that in the studio tab. And that's sort of where we have all of our tips and tricks, our blogs, our projects, that kind of thing. And we have lots of tips and tricks for selling successfully at farmers markets and at craft shows. So this leads right into the next question perfectly. Just Kibby says, asks, what is some kind of general and helpful advice for new melt and pour soap makers? How can we make our soap stand out against CP? cold process soap makers and vendors? So that's a great question. I started out making melt and pour soap. That's why when I had Anne Marie Soap Works and I was selling at farmers markets and I was selling at craft shows, it was all melt and pour soap. The reason for that was I loved being able to actually control my inventory and control it that week based on what I needed, right? There was, for me back then, I didn't have to inventory plan. And I didn't look at melt and pour soap as anything but amazing soap. Because if you buy like say Brambleberry melt and pour bases, it is amazing soap. It's made with real vegetable oils. It doesn't have synthetic detergents in it. It's fantastic for your skin. It rinses away cleanly. And what I love about Mountain Pour Soap is it allows you to do a lot of things you can't with cold process soap. So you can make the soap, 
and use it that afternoon. You can have clear soap. You can do embeds that are really interesting and like very easy to do. You have lots of really cool mold options and you can be trendy with melt and pour soap in a way that you really can't with cold process soap. And so I would really be focusing on the quality ingredients in the melt and pour soap, focusing on the fact that you can you can do cool things with melt and pour that you just can't with cold process soap and make sure that you're wrapping it really attractively you're labeling it and you are calling out the fact that this product does use real skin loving ingredients in it so just because you're using a pre-made base doesn't mean you can't appeal to all forms of potential customers right you could just be using sea clay and essential oils in your melt and pour base or you could be doing it fragrance oils, and really fun colors. But either way, you'll be able to find a niche that is different and unique for you. And as long as you let your signage do the talking, meaning have really cool signs up that explain about the ingredients and the pricing and that kind of stuff, you'll be able to handle more people coming into your booth and not have to talk to them all the time and explain to them why this is real soap, how this is real soap, and how it does benefit their skin much more than say a synthetically uh, synthetically produced detergent based giant manufactured soap at the store. So Cheeky Goat Soaps asks, what are some organizing tips you wish you would have known when you started to grow? So honestly, what I really wish I would have known when I started to grow was that I could not do it all. I'm actually not good at doing it all and other people are better at certain aspects of business than I am. When I started growing, I felt so kind of like, is this happening, is this growing? And so kind of just, insecure about my abilities to do anything that I micromanaged anybody I was able to actually hire to help me, right? Like, are they doing the wrapping well enough? Are they doing this well enough? So I really wish that I recognized early on that there are a lot of people that do a lot better than me and I need to delegate more because what I do is special and unique and different. And so what you do, Cheeky Goat Soaps, I bet is pretty special, unique and different. So I don't know if what you're really good at is selling or maybe you're really good at formulating or maybe you're actually really good at manufacturing but the, my best organizing tip is to hire people as you can around you to do the things that you're either not good at doing or the things you don't like to do so that you can work more on whatever magic you have that makes your business special because no one loves your baby like you do and no one's gonna sell your product like you're able to sell and so for me early on my very first hire was someone to help me pack boxes right because honestly me and spatial ability not like, it's not like, it's not great, not great at all. So that was the first person I hired. And then the second person I hired was someone to help me with like accounting. And it wasn't because I couldn't do it. I can do it. And I interestingly, like my master's degree, the, it's an accounting proficiency master's degree. I can do it. I am not good at it. Other people are better at it. So when I give other people things to do, I'm actually freeing up my time to do the thing that I am the best at. And so my biggest organizing tip is actually does not around really like spatial organization or uh, organizing system or boxes. It is just to hire people out for the stuff you're not good at. In terms of organizing my time, I've written lots of blog posts on organizing my time. I am relentless and ruthless about following Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People when it comes to time management. Meaning, I always prioritize buckets in my life that are important to me. So family, friends, experiences, and those are the main things I schedule. And then everything else flows around it. And that includes, interestingly enough, work. So that means I often work really weird long hours, like work in the early mornings or work late at night so I can prioritize experience, friends, and family and community. But that's the system that's really worked for me. And I've had a day planner since I was in high school. I had a Franklin Covey day planner in high school. Now I use, I think I'm using a passion planner right now or a tools for life one. And every week I just go through and I organize my time. So that way I make sure that I'm focusing on the things that matter during the day, as opposed to letting the kind of flotsam and jetsam of life just me back and forth where I end up just going from one thing to another, as opposed to this is my number one today, this is my number two. Kelly Lau asks, what advice do I have for soap makers who are trying to start a business and do you have any tips to get your business running? It's so interesting that you asked this because I just spent this week with a friend who wants to start a bone broth business. And so every single day I was sending her, texting her with what her assignments were for the day. And interestingly enough, starting a soap making business is real similar to starting a bone broth business. Many people get into soap making because of the alchemy. They are creative. They like to create. And then all of a sudden they go, wait, 
This is a really amazing product. I have a lot of it now. I really like creating, but I, this is an expensive hobby. I should probably start selling it. Or their family and friends have said, this is really great. Have you thought about selling it? And then they kind of start selling it, but they don't know how to price it. And they become an accidental entrepreneur. And like, who knows if they're making money, they're not sure. And then all of a sudden, you know, they have a part-time gig selling soap, but they don't know if they're making money. So first and foremost, if you're really, really serious about starting a business, start looking at those numbers right away. Meaning if you want to start a business, how many bars of soap do you need to sell in order to make the money you need to make? Learn how to do a really rudimentary, a really basic, easy profit and loss, right? This is how much money I need, I'm selling my bar of soap for. This is how much it cost me to make the bar of soap. This is what packaging cost me. This is what the, the cost of goods sold, all the materials that went into the bar of soap cost me. This is what taxes and insurance are gonna, and licenses cost me. And ugh, this is what labor might actually cost me if I ever actually hired someone. And then look at that bottom line and go, is that positive or is it negative on the bottom line? If it's negative, go back to the drawing board, figure out what you need to do to either decrease your costs in here or increase your sales, sales dollars numbers in here. But either way, run that and be really honest with yourself. Are you gonna start a small empire? Are you gonna start a small business where you can support you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, and actually like do a shop? You can do it. Lots and lots of customers of Brambleberry.com do that and have done that successfully. But it's also okay to look at all those numbers and go, you know what, that is actually not that much fun. I have decided I'm gonna be realistic with myself. I'm gonna do like five craft shows a year. I'm gonna make enough money to send my kid to summer camp and I'm gonna make enough money that I can afford to upgrade my car next year. But eh, I really don't want an empire. It's cool being a part-time business. It is okay to be a lifestyle CEO, to use Donna Maria Johnson's term on that. It is a-okay. So in terms of starting a business, if you're really gonna start a business, get serious about the numbers right off the bat. Is this a viable business? I've seen lots of soap making businesses. I know it is viable, but I don't know what your ingredients are. I don't know what your costs are. I don't know what you want to make as a margin. I don't know if you're operating out of Nashville, Tennessee, or say a cheaper suburb, for example, that type of thing. So get real serious about your costs and then start to do all the fun stuff, which is the creation of products, the marketing plans, coming up with the name for the website, all of that kind of stuff. Do that after you do the hard thing, right? Feared things first. Do the hard thing, profit and loss first, and then the business stuff, all the fun creative marketing stuff follows. Okay. What is your favorite Brambleberry fragrance? My favorite go-to Brambleberry fragrance is always energy. What products does Anne Marie feel she can't live without? From Brambleberry, definitely like argan oil. I love that for my skin. I can't live without obviously coconut oil and olive oil because I'm such a cold process soap maker. I definitely cannot live with some, without some of our exfoliants and scrubbies because I constantly am tossing them in lotions and just making little scrubby face masks for myself. So yeah, those are the products for sure that I can't live without from Brambleberry. But can I say the whole warehouse? Have you ever gotten hurt when making something? who hasn't gotten a lie burner 15 but no never been really like hurt with anything with brambleberry but i've also been a really safety conscious soap maker my whole like soap making career why doesn't my soap make more suds and or bubbles even though i follow a good soap recipe well your super fat might be too high or i mean is it my recipe? Is it a, is it a good recipe? I don't know. Um, you probably, what I would do, honestly, I would get the lots of lather quick mix from brambleberry.com. Use that a few times and see if it creates more lather for you. And if it does, then you know, there are some improvements you can make to your recipe. What does your cleanup process look like after making bath and body products? Oh, the cleanup process for bath and body. Well, first of all, it's a podcast in my ear for sure. Always listen to a podcast or a book on tape. Um, but I wipe out the cold process like dishes usually and with like a paper towel and just get any extra off if I haven't scraped the bowl clean. And then I toss that and then just, it's unfortunately like synthetic detergent like Dawn and use that to cut through the grease and then wash right away. Some soap makers leave their dishes like to kind of cure and then wash. I don't do that anymore. I wash right away, get it done right away. Lots of hot water, lots of Dawn dishwashing detergent. Why do you cure the soap? 
I carry the soap and really everybody carries the soap because even though 97% of the saponification reaction is done within the first 30 minutes of the soap making process, and this was proven by Kevin Dunn with his college uh, students doing uh, that kind of scientific testing, even though most of the saponification process, which is the fancy word for oils and water and lime mixing and neutralizing, is done in the first 30 minutes, the last 3% is what takes a six weeks. So if you want a really gentle bar of soap, you need that full six weeks. Plus you have to cure the soap anyways to let the water evaporate out because your water is the carrier for the lye. It doesn't really serve any usefulness in the soap. So you want it out because it just softens the soap. Which do you prefer to make? Melt and pour, cold process or hot process? Which do I prefer to make? Mountain pour, cold process, or hot process? It's like asking me to choose a baby. It's such a flat. Um, if I could only make one soap for the rest of my life, it's Oh, tough call. Um, I'm gonna go with cold process. Oh, it's tough though because melt and pour my kids can do with me, but cold process soap, I just, I love that alchemy. Love it. Melt and pour tips and tricks that you swear by. Melt and pour tips and tricks that I swear by. Uh, one, never boil the soap. Two, always use rubbing alcohol in the very back of every single bar of soap you make. And three, if you have sweating problems, use a fan, run it over the soap when you pop it out and the sweating problems go away. How do we get the fragrance in cold process soaps to last without fading away? Ooh, fragrances in cold process soaps, it's a natural kind of air transfer, right? You have a molecule in the fragrance that wants to evaporate right out. So a couple things. One, you can use kind of the maximum that you should be using in the soap. So 0.7 ounces to all the way up to one ounce per pound of finished soap products. Two, after the soap is cured, go ahead and uh, put some fragrance on cotton balls. Put the cotton balls and the soap in the same container and that will help kind of infuse the soap with the fragrance as though it was like a drawer sachet for your socks, for example. So those are two of my trip trips. Those are two of my tricks for making the fragrances last longer. If you could only eat one flavor of ice cream for the rest of your life, what would it be? Chocolate chip mint. Thanks so much for watching me on today's Ask Anne Marie. I hope you learned something. Make sure you post your questions every single time we answer and maybe I'll get a chance to answer your question. I can't wait to see you on social media. Make sure to hashtag Bramble on for anything you make and create so we can all see what you're doing. Until next time, happy soaping. To the left, everything you own in the box to the left. Because you said take a bath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay.